Switch to AT&T prepaid and get two months of free service with no annual contract on AT&T's network. Huh. You know, my wife wanted two months free, and she jetted off to the Canary Islands and met some tennis pro named Sergio. Kevin? She doesn't even like canaries. Stick to the script, please. Sorry, Dan. It's Don. Don. <clears throat> That's prepaid your way from AT&T. Limited time offer requires payment at activation taxes extra. Account must remain active on $45 or $65 plan. and cannot lapse to get bill credit for 30 and 12 months. Fees, coverage, and other restrictions apply. Details at att.com slash prepaid. Love Talk Radio. Good morning, everyone, and welcome to my Tuesday edition of Sam Crow Radio. Um, in case all of you haven't heard by the plethora that we've shown all out on Facebook, obviously today we are hosting one of the, what I call, gentle giants of the show, Sons of Anarchy, which would be Dayton Kelly. Um, today we're going to embark upon a conversation of numerous things today. First and foremost, Obviously, we most know him from Sons of Anarchy, but his body of work is just so inclusive, both in film and television. Obviously, he's been in Deadwood. He's been in a number of different uh, projects. He's also performed in a capacity as it relates to being a writer and as a producer. So I'm very, very excited to ask about all of these different elements. Um, Today's a little special show in that normally we do a live question and answer session, but we've kind of gone the route of foregoing that in this particular instance, just because, well, frankly, it's nice to have Dayton Kelly in my ear for an hour, obviously. But um, I, I appreciate and I want to say thank you so much to the individuals that took the time to actually post up questions for him and to um, kind of get involved with the process. And I want to make it known to everybody in the future, certainly if there are ideas or thoughts or things in which you want to project to me um, to incorporate into the show, either to myself and, of course, obviously to my lovely companion and partner, Sam Crow. certainly at any point in time, if you wish to forward information to us relative to the show, whether it be um, a future guest or ideas, comments, suggestions, you hate me, you like me, you think the show is going really well, it sucks, pretty much anything. We have a couple outlets, so um, make sure to get a hold of us. Now, without further ado, it looks like Dayton's on the line, so let's get on. Good morning, Dayton. Hello. Hello. How are you? <laughs> I'm fine. I'm fine. I'm, ex- How are you? I'm excited. Oh, my God. I'm so <laughs> excited. I can't stand it. I got all these well, questions for you. I'm really uh-oh. excited. No, I'll be easy on you. I promise. I promise. Thank you very I, much. I actually. Thank you. I, I am. I'm excited, and I have a lot of good questions that you probably don't expect me to ask. So, okay. I'll, I'll try. I want to start off by I want to start off by telling you that you're wonderful. So I'm gonna make you blush in the first thirty five seconds and then we'll move yeah, on to that. Thank you um, very much. You're welcome. Um I know that you're encompassed within a legion of fellow Scottish actors like naming Ray Sir Sean Connery and Ewan McGregor, Doug Ray Scott, James McAvoy, just to name a few. Can I ask you, um, what sort of challenge it poses to, and I'm assuming you do this, obviously, alter your dialect for the various roles that you portray? Um, actually, I just referenced people that I've, I've met along the way. And, you know, I've lived a lot of different places. So uh, I'll know somebody who I will say talks like this person or this character that I'm doing. So they'll be in... Um, They'll be in my <clears throat> my head, you know, my uh, in my ear. I, you know, I think I was a musician for so long too that I'm I'm fortunate that I can pick up uh, dialects and rhythms because you know speech is like like a song. People sing, you know, mm-hmm. they don't realize it, but they're saying it's not much. <laughs> you know, but they're, you know, different countries, different things have different songs and, and rhythms, and uh, I'm able to, to hear them um, and, you know, and and duplicate them. So, uh, but there's usually somebody I know in my past okay. or something that I've met and, and then thought that's the okay. voice. Yeah. I mean, plus my own is going to be there, but that's you know the rhythms I, I kind of uh, adapt. Okay, so did you always? Did you have, like, a thick Scottish accent coming from where you were, or was it just not very prevalent? No, I don't No, No, I don't know where it came I don't know where it came up that I was born in Scotland. That's, that's it's not true. I don't know where this shit comes from. I don't know. I'll raise my hand and tell you. I can tell you because it's on your profile. I researched you. I, and it's, I, it's, I, I, I know it is. I know it is. I just don't understand how it comes in, and gets there. Really? I don't know. I don't put anything on there. I've never put anything on there. I uh, don't even know how. 
So all of a sudden, shit appears, and I go, well, that's interesting. Okay, you know, great. Now I'm going right to sound like there. an idiot. <laughs> Wonderful. Because <laughs> that's my no, next no. question. I'm like, what was it like to be raised in Scotland? Um, no, it was. I imagine it was wonderful, <laughs> you know, <laughs> in my in my in my imaginary brain. It was wonderful. <laughs> okay, so but, now I got to uh, ask you then: Where did you grow up? Where did I grow up? Well, I haven't grown up yet, so. No, with well, that we know. Yeah, um, I was born in Newark, New Jersey. And um, okay. uh, but I lived a lot of different places. I, I, I was the, the day on my seventeenth birthday. I, I, you know, I left home, um, not for bad reasons or anything, just because I was ready to go, and uh, I was going to get married and, and all that stuff. Not only kid, that kind of thing. Mm-hmm. Um, so I, I mean, I lived uh, I, 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 everywhere. Uh, dozens, of, dozens of places. I mean, every, all, everywhere along the East Coast, uh, in the Midwest, and, and a little bit in Georgia, a little bit in Arizona, and I mean Nevada, uh, I, I just all over. Uh, I used to work at the racetrack, and so wow. um, yeah, I used to shovel horse shit. That was my first job. <laughs> shovel horse shit, and uh, it was just fun, you know. And so I would move around with the tracks a, a little bit. Um, okay. with the racetracks. So that's, and you know, that's just kind of everywhere. Um, I, I, my, all my relatives and everybody are back in the East Coast. Um, oh, okay. Like, uh, they're, on, they're in Pennsylvania and New Jersey, most of them, and Florida. So. But, um, I gotcha. So that's kind of where I grew up. There's a little bit everywhere. Okay, I gotcha. So somebody will have to let IBBM know that they're full of shit, basically. No. I, I, why? It doesn't matter. <laughs> no, I hear you. Does it no, really I, matter? <laughs> no, it doesn't. Of course, that kind of looked yeah. like an idiot, because here's the interviewer. Uh, yeah, let's talk about Scotland. Not. Apparently, you're not from there. <clears throat> okay. that's, not, that's all right. You're not the first one. <laughs> okay. Well, thank you very much. Yeah, let's try to I get, I get people, better. I get people, I get people that they, they write me letters and say, I, I think we grew up together. In Scotland, no, I don't, I don't think so. But you know, you know, I, I think uh, you know you remember, you know, the Kellys out in 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 Scotland. And, oh, okay, uh, they're nice people. <laughs> you know, I hope so. Funny is that? Oh my gosh! Now I want to ask you: uh, Was your family surprised at all in any way, or maybe apprehensive uh, when you decided to come home and say, "Guess what? I'm going to be an actor." I can't tell you what my father said. I, you know, um, it's uh, no. My my mother still, you know, she lived to be ninety three, and uh, she still didn't know I had a job as an actor. She she couldn't comprehend it. She was. Uh, I remember I was, she was watching television. She she was out there living with me in uh, this um, well a nursing home, you know. Her halfway house where it was and gradually got worse. But she was watching television one night and maybe I go pick her up and she goes, I saw you on television last night. I said, Oh really? What what show? She goes, I don't know what show. I well, what is it doing? You know, I'm trying to figure out what the, you know, what she saw. Right. She says, I don't know. I said, Well what was I wearing? Was it a suit? I look like a cop? I, I don't know, I don't know. You know, now you were dressed nice. I said, Okay, well what was the scene about it? You know, and she goes I don't know. You walked out of the room, so I changed the channel. <laughs> okay. She thought if I had the one thing that walked out of the room, and that was over. The show was over. Oh, my goodness. So she was never really, she didn't really get it. She, okay. so I would walk in, I would take her to the doctor's office, and, you know, they, they was, the doctors would be, at the time, uh, huge Deadwood fans. You know, I'd, I'd wheel her in the wheelchair, and we'd go to for a, um, you know, inspection or whatever. And, uh, you know, all the doctors would say hello and hey, how are you? And da da because they're huge fans. And my, my mother would always look at me and she'd go, You know these people? How come they know you? How do they say hello to you? I said, I just, yeah, I know them. You know, but she never, she could never, she never got it. So, and my father died a long time ago, so he got, he never got a chance to see it. So, I would have been, it would have been nice, you know, because, uh, he said, what the fuck, I want to do that for. But he said it in other words. He what the fuck. 
You know, it was I, I told him at three o'clock in the morning. He, he used to get up, he used to read the racing for him. You know, he'd be always up reading the racing for him. And I came in. I was a musician at the time, so I guess it wasn't too much of a stretch. You know. I get that. Yeah. Yeah. I get it. Sure. Now, when you were younger, I was curious to ask you the question of. Um, how did you get to this point? I mean, did you start looking at fellow actors maybe early on when you were a young boy and saying to yourself, yeah, this inspires me? What what kind of gave you the push to do what you want to do right now, or what you are doing, I should say, right now? I, I, I never wanted to be an actor. I, that was, uh, you know, <laughs> I was a musician. You know, I got into music. I, I went from Shovel and Horseshoe. I did a million jobs. I had, like, over 50 jobs. I wrote them all down one day. And um, just to go just to, out of the hand, I had a lot of jobs. So uh, I I was a musician at the time. I just came back from Reno, and you know I was married, and my life was going to hell, and you know real quick. And so I was I came back to the East Coast to kind of regroup, you know, because uh, mm-hmm. ended up in Pennsylvania. And a friend of mine who I had gotten into acting before I left, you know, he was he was asking me, you know, well, I'm, you know, I'm an actor, I want to be an actor. So we just go fucking do it, you know. What do you mean? What do you, what do you got to lose? You know, you single, you ain't got no. Sh- Nothing to worry about. I'll go be a fucking actor. So I asked him back. You know, I came back and he was doing a play uh, off Broadway or in rehearsals. And, and he said, man, I can't get it. I can't get this fucking role, man. Would you do me a favor? Would you do this part for me? Mm-hmm. And I went, I'm, I'm not, what do you mean? What are you, crazy? I'm like, God. And he said, no, no, man, you're perfect for the role. So I said, well, he said, just do me a favor. Come meet the director. We open in 10 days. So I said, oh, sorry. Well, I heard this shit. So I went, I said, well, I met this director, and we told him I did some acting bullshit, you know. And I actually was perfect for the role. So um, he gave me the job. And the next 10 days later, I was on stage. And I thought, well, this is all right. I'll just do this for a little while, mm-hmm. you know, until well, I get a group together and get my band back together. So, you know, that's how I got into it. I kind of stayed cool. into it. And then it became an art form to me. It became a contest because I could I be any good, you know. Right. And then it was a challenge, so that's how I stayed in it. But I was always intending on going back to being a musician. Sure. And I never, you know. Gotcha. That's how that happened. <laughs> was that interesting? I don't know. Yeah. Oh my God, you are so interesting. You don't even. I don't even think you realize how interesting <laughs> you are. You're going to find out as you keep talking to me. Um, now, an actor of your magnitude, I, I'm guessing, does not rise to your stature or find your kind of plethora of success without some kind of formal training. So can you maybe tell us um, where you received any of your training, whether the theater, acting, that sort of thing? Yeah, well, I did, you know, I started out in theater in New York. I did, God, I, I started out studying with a guy named Michael Schulman and uh, a lady named Julie Blasso. Now, Michael's still alive and well. Julie passed on long about 20 years ago. She's, uh, you know, but she was a brilliant playwright and a very hard woman. But she was she had a great eye. She she was an actress. If you saw the movie The Verdict, she played the the, the mother of. Uh, oh, anyway, um, so I, I studied with her, and, and and I was always doing doing plays, and, and I, I I really was lucky because I caught a guy who used to um, be a casting director at Joe Papp's uh, Public Theater in New York, and he got into acting. I mean, not acting, directing. And he hired me in one of my first plays. It was an off off Broadway play. Mm-hmm. But I really kind of—he was a good teacher, uh, you know. And and I don't know how to explain it, but it, it just—I studied. I never went to a school, uh, but I studied with people and, and, and like your workshops, classes out here, you know. But mm-hmm. in New York, it's a little different. They're a little more, I think, intense. Um, I, I just think it's because it's cl- people are closely grouped together, you know. So. Um, and I, I just kept working that way, and, and you know, he was this one guy. All of them said the best way to learn is to throw yourself on stage whenever you can, because you learn faster in front of people when you fuck up, you know. Mm-hmm. Sure. <laughs> so uh, it's, it's like on you know, on the job training is is I think very uh, beneficial, you know. So um, I kind of did it, all of that stuff, I, I, and then um, I did like. Uh, I don't know, 16 plays in one one year. I did 29 um, NYU films because once I got into the film click, because that was later on, mm-hmm. uh, my girlfriend actually submitted me for something, and I you know got the job, and 
it seemed like a good way to, for a beginner to get a reel together because nobody would hire you. They would all give you the same bullshit, you know. Oh, well, what do you, let's see what you do, you know. And you, you should have some tape on yourself to, to show them so, you know, mm-hmm. they know what you do. So the only way I could get tape is uh, going to these film schools. I went to NYU, you know, only not a, as a student, but as a, you know, an actor, you know, participant. Mm-hmm. Uh, because so, you're always looking for people, you know. And um, once you, if you get the reputation of being good, everybody wants to use you in their film. So, you know, I was lucky that way that, that some people wanted to use me. And so, so I, the show, I still have them. They're funny as hell. You know, I like to look at them. I mean, every once in a while I go back, I go, oh my God, like I had hair, I had a fucking mustache. You know, <laughs> I was I was young and everything. So that's pretty cool, man. Who is that? <laughs> you know, but it's fun to look at because you know, and I'm, some of it is really really good stuff. You know, I should put it online or something because it's just yes, you should. Yes, you, you know, they're should. all they're all short good. films. They're only they only last like ten to, to eight, seventeen, eighteen minutes. You know, they're real short. You know, so they're. No, there's no features in there, but it was fun. That's kind of the way I learned on the job. I mean, you learn a lot when going from stage to, to to film is very different. So you you have to adjust your your acting. Um, I bet. Yeah, that's one know. thing I wanted to ask you about too. Was because I know a lot of the actors I've interviewed in the past have kind of foregoed that training and kind of said, okay, well I did an acting class or I did this or this. So it kind of sounds like you agree with that ideology and that you know, like you're saying, professional or experience is the best way to go. Well, yeah. I mean, I, I don't. I, I mean, I did plays. I mean, you, you do workshops, but also you, I did plays in front of audiences, live audiences. I mean, you know, hundred mostly all under a hundred seat houses, off off Broadway. Okay. Um, matter of fact, they all were. Um, no one would ever hire me for off Broadway or Broadway. Really? And I had that. They had. Well, you, you got to at the time when I was doing it. You have to have. You had to be a name. They they wanted a name to bring the audience in. You know. I mean, you know, so I, I did a lot of off off Broadway plays, but uh, they were, uh, you know, real audiences. <laughs> really, you know, you didn't want to fuck up, so it, it was it was good practice. It was a good, you know, rehearsal, and then and then going. I was constantly going back from the film to the to the stage. So you know, your acting is a little different. It's a little bigger for for stage, but not. I never like to go too big, but. Um, really? Yeah. <laughs> Why the <is it> show? <laughs> I was gonna say, <laughs> like, Dayton, you got to big here. <laughs> no, no. I mean, I'm an, oh no, no, no. I mean, over the top as far as acting goes. Oh, like, exactly. You know, okay. Hamming it up. You know, wait a minute. You know, like they used to say in in, in the theater. You know, you got to play to the last row. Well, no, you don't. <laughs> no, you don't. Because <laughs> you look like an asshole in the first row. If you're playing to the last. <laughs> You know, oh, you're speaking oh, in these voices. You're speaking in these voices. Not like, hey, you know, right. come on, oh, man. Sure. Hey, yeah. Please, that's my okay. All right, now I'm gonna um, make you blush some more. So prepare yourself here. Um, for those that are listening that don't know, um, Dayton has four different titles that I'm aware of, which is of course actor, writer, producer, and of course as a musician. I'd like to maybe expound on that element of your life, meaning um, where did you get your love of music and what age you started? And um, I'm curious as to why you adore John Coltrane. Oh, well, um, <laughs> I actually um, was influenced by my uncle. My uncle was, a, was one of the top-notch um, arranger of saxophone players. He graduated from Juilliard and everything. He was like... You know, the real deal. And and he uh, got into arranging and playing, you know. So when I was six years old, he was he was playing at, at a, happened to be playing at a, a bar, you know, where my um, my grandmother lived, near my grandmother. So my father and I went to see my grandmother, and then we stayed in for, the, I guess it was, I'm looking at it now, it was the first set. So he took me to see my uncle, my Uncle Bill. And... Uh, now my uncle Bill was six five, probably two forty, two fifty. He's a big motherfucker, man. He's and he's you know playing the sax mm-hmm. in the old days. What they used to do is is they would walk the bar, for and they would put tips in the in the horn of a uh, of the saxophone. You know they throw a dollar in the in, in the horn. 
as as the guy walked down the bar, you know, who you know right past the customers, you know what I mean? So mm-hmm. now I was probably three foot two, and I'm standing on the floor. Now there's the bar, and then there's my uncle walking the bar. So I go in just as my uncle's walking the bar, and I it was the most terrifying thing I've ever seen in my life. It was the most powerful. I was stunned. And he's playing this rock and roll song coming down the bar. And just, he sees me and just, I guess at the time I'm thinking about it, you know, as an adult, he's hamming it up, you know, mm-hmm. and playing louder and playing hard rock and roll, you know, uh, Johnny and Hurricanes kind of shit, you know. So uh, that was my most impressive moment I've ever seen. It was the most powerful thing I've ever seen in my life as far as an image. And, you know, we stayed for the one song, and then naturally I had to leave, you know, because I was supposed to be in there. <laughs> but, um, you know, then so then I never played again. But I never I never forgot that. And, and then I, uh, we, you know, I'm probably in my 20s, early 20s. We were all sitting around. We were all hippies. We were all smoking weed and all this shit. And, you know, it was book stock and all that fucking stuff. And we were all sitting around, I lived in a community, there was like 13 of us lived in a house, it was me, I had my wife and two kids, you know, and and we were all part of this big community that lived there, you know, and, and so it was a friend of mine's house, and uh, it had seven or eight bedrooms, but I had a separate apartment, but that was not separate, it was just walled off with a door, and I slept, and my kids and everything on this half, and you open the door and walk through. But anyway, so we were all just hanging around, and, and one day somebody says, why don't we start a band? So we all picked instruments, you know, and I picked the saxophone. Now, my uncle had stopped playing at the time, so he gave me his horn. He says, here, use this fucking thing, you know. I'm not playing it anymore. He was strictly into arranging and stuff. And so um, that's how I, we all started playing. We all formed the band within, I don't know, a year we were playing out. We were playing just rock and roll, you know, and bars and shit. And, uh, you know, at that time it was, you know, Earth, Wind, and Fire, Tower of Power, all them horn groups. There were big horn groups in Chicago. So, uh, well, I was, my life was fine. And, you know, we struck a lot of very, I was work, so I would be working an oil truck, driving an oil truck at the time, and you know, practicing at night and playing, and getting our seven, eight dollars a, a gig. But a friend of mine, who his father was a, was a musician, a jazz musician, comes over one day and he says, "I want you to listen to this guy." And I said, "Well, he says John Culture, and he gives me Giant Steps, a record." He says, "Yeah, put this on." And I don't, you know, familiar with Giant Steps, but it's like one of his greatest albums yeah, as far as technique and it's fucking it's just phenomenal. It's the, the standard, you know. Every musician in the world wants to play Giant Steps because it's a challenge, and I still can't play it to this day. Never could. No. Really? But anyway, I put yeah, I put it on, and it was, it was the, it was it was incredible, and then that became my next challenge to try to get really really good. And I just, um, you know, him, John Coltrane, and Sonny Rollins, they just do it for me, you know. They mm-hmm. just, uh, they're just great, you know. I love, I love both of them different, in different ways, you know. Sure. Well, and, I uh, do you remember the first song you ever played? Uh, yeah. Well, we used to get shot at. <laughs> okay. We. If we played bad, we'd get, I swear to God, I'm, God strike me dead, we'd get shot at. People would throw oh shit at us. <laughs> we'd get fucking, people would throw cool cigarettes, they would throw change on the stage. <laughs> this is because I play, we played a lot in Newark, and it's a rough place to play. Uh, one time we were playing, we were up on, two, 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 I'll tell you about two experiences. <laughs> Once it was, we were playing, and with the bar, if you look the band was, you know, up on a bandstand, and we, we faced straight out. There was an oblong bar. Now, to the left of the bar was an exit, an entrance and exit, and to the right of the bar, you know, was an, another entrance. So one guy standing on the right of the bar. Now, the, the, the oblong bar held about, I'd, I'd say, 50, 60 people. It was a huge oblong bar. Um, 
So it was it was packed, and we're standing on, we're playing a song on stage. All of a sudden, this guy comes in from the entrance door to the left side, sees the guy on the right side, pulls out a gun, and starts shooting at him. <laughs> so he's fucking shooting at him. He ducks. This guy gets up. He starts shooting at this fucking guy, and he. <laughs> Then they they all run. He runs out in the street and then jumps in the car and the other guy runs after him. He's shooting at the car and we're still playing. Oh my god! Yeah, it was, it was like that shit happened quite often. And one time we were playing at a gypsy wedding. Now we got a head of a linoleum knife pulled on me. One guy used to spit and we had two saxophones. The kid comes up and spits in my friend's saxophone <laughs> like a spittoon. <laughs> It was just terrible. Then it ended up, I don't know, in, in those days, the gypsy weddings, um, the, the wife and or the groom, it's a, what do you call it, a maid marriage or something at home. And the groom and the bride, and they never see each other until they, I mean, they see each other as kids, and then they never see each other until they get married. Mm-hmm. Well, you know, obviously, the, the, right, I can't, we couldn't understand them. They spoke, you know, gypsies or something. And, and, um, we didn't understand anything. We played the whole night. We played three songs. The only song they ever wanted to hear was something by Santana. And then uh, some other fucking song we sang. I don't know what it was. But. Mm-hmm. And anyway, the the bride decides, after did the wedding, she comes in in a white dress and, and sees the groom. She decides, I don't want to marry him. <gasps> yeah. All really? Hell, like, all hell broke loose. All, all hell broke loose. I mean, then they just started fighting. They started fighting, and we're packing up shit, and then they start getting mad at us for some reason. So they're fighting each other, and then, then they come and fight us. So we're fighting, but we got mic stands, and we're <laughs> fighting them off. And thank God the cops came because, you know, we were going to be the the uh, brunt of their uh, anger. But the, the whole thing, the wedding was off. They broke up, and, and we never got paid. Aww. Right. Yeah. No, I know. It's dumb. Can I tell you another quick one? Go ahead. I'll tell you another quick one. Okay, we were, we were playing one time. We were in this, we were in this five-piece band. And we were standing on, standing on stage, and, and it's a real mafia bar, right? So so uh, it's the bartender. You started at 9 o'clock. It didn't matter if anybody's there or not. You started playing at 9 o'clock. So we're playing, mm-hmm. and there's, there's, a, there's the bartender. There's one other guy, and then there's this guy in a suit and his, his girlfriend sitting right, blonde girlfriend sitting right next to him. You know, and I, I mean, they're, I guess they were in their 40s. Mm-hmm. Uh, and, and she's drunk on her ass, right? And she's got her head down, right. you know. So, the back, is, so we're, we're playing, and, you know, we're, we're, we're just kind of warming up, playing, No, you know, nobody's listening. So, we, you right. know, we play a song. We, and we play a song called I'm a Girl Watcher, right? Mm-hmm. I don't know if you remember that song. I'm a Girl Watcher. Oh, God, watcher. yes, I do. Mm-hmm. Yep. So, we play the song, and, you know, uh, it, it, the guy, the leader, goes, he looks over, and we talk, and um, I don't know, you know, what do you want to play next? I don't know. Let's play it. You know, we're long, you know, just mumbling shit amongst ourselves. And so the girl lifts her head up. She goes, play on the girl watcher. And my friend goes, okay, uh, we just, you know, we just played the song, so we'll, we'll get it for you in, in a little later. You know, and she goes, play on the girl watcher. Uh, and he's impolite, and he goes, all right, I, I, we'll get I, we're gonna start, We start talking, and, and, and she goes, I want to hear I'm a girl watcher. She says, I, 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 I'll promise, we'll, we'll do the song. The guy reaches into his coat, pulls out a fucking gun, and goes, play the fucking song. <laughs> so Gary goes, I want a two. I want you. I'm a girl watcher. <laughs> and we're like, and finally he goes, play the fucking song. Okay? <laughs> wow. wow. That's music. Oh, my God. So my Let me just say, folks, God. Thank God Dayton <laughs> Kelly didn't die in a bar. Jesus. Uh, well, I could have died a couple other places. Well, yeah, okay. Thank you very much. We're all very lucky and grateful you're here. Thank you. God, you're scaring me with oh. these stories. Goodness. You're welcome. Um, well. I have another question relative to that. I'm wondering, um, and, and this is under the guise, of course, that you have done any form of musical work while obviously doing your regular schedule. I wonder if you find yourself with a restricted time allotment to devote to music since your schedule, as far as shooting goes, is so encompassing. Uh, yeah, I mean, I, when, we, when we're filming, it, it's, it's harder to 
practice and play. So, um, mm-hmm. you know, I'm not at the point where I'm, I'm, I'm only, I'm only, I mean, I stopped playing for 15 years. I didn't touch the thing. And so I started gradually fooling around, getting back. I did a play where I, excuse me, I played saxophone. So that got me a little bit tuned up. And then I, uh, I put it down again, and so I only, I only started really kind of, I don't even want to say seriously, because not yet, but um, practice, practicing more and more um, over the last year and a half or two years. So it, it's, But I don't feel like I'm ready to go out and, and, and do it yet. I don't have the stamina in my lip to uh, yeah. play what I hear. Yeah, it, it takes a while. It, it takes a good while. I mean, I, you know, I could go out and sound like shit, but that ain't gonna happen, <laughs> you know. <laughs> ain't gonna do that. You know, I mean, I can. I mean, I don't want to sound like fucking Bill Clinton, you know. No, but I'm surprised. I'm really surprised to hear you say that because you just you resonate such a passion for music. So I'm really shocked to hear you say that. I thought you'd be busted at the seams to go out there. I am, but it just you can't rush it. You just you just can't rush okay. it. So uh and it, no but just the, 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 the um i'm I'm blessed to be working and 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 fun to be working on a great show and, and having a good time so yeah. it's uh, you know it's no problem i could come on i got you know, six months out of the year i can just i can play all i want so sure it's no, no i understand got it I was just throwing that out there because I'm like, if I'm going to travel yeah. all the way to California at some point, I can't go see Dayton Kelly live. So you've just uh, lost my entire let's day hope now. Something. Let's hope something. <laughs> yeah. It just, it just don't come out too soon. <laughs> <laughs> all up? right, yeah. thanks. Per Dayton, I'm waiting a year. Okay. okay. Um, now, looking at your resume, I noticed that you must have a good, and this is my assumption, solid working relationship with fellow actor Michael Madsen. Um, for those that don't know, in 96, you wrote the film Last Days of Frankie the Fly. In 97, of course, um, writing and producing for Executive Target. I wanted to ask you, um, how did that collaboration occur between Michael and yourself? Uh, well, it actually started on Frankie the Fly. And we also did a series together called um, Vengeance Unlimited. Um, yeah, we we were um, really, really close. Uh, and, he, you know, he, he kind of liked my writing and... and I, he was easy to write for, so we kind of just um, started working together. I mean, we liked each other personally, so uh, that that was that was a big help. And, and you know, we had the same kind of sensibilities and things like that. And it was fun. We had I had we had good times. We had very good times together. And um, then, uh, well, shit happens, you know. Uh, no, I love just, you know, shit happens. But I mean, I, I love him, you know, to this day. It's, 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 it's uh, we just, we just kind of lost contact, you know. Mm, and, uh, gotcha. Yeah, I've always been in my own. It was, it was fun. He, he's not. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. I got all his books. And, you know, he's, he's. So uh, we, 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 we were pretty tight for about six or seven years, you know. Uh, you know, I I talk to him every day. You know, but sure. um, this shit happens. I understand. Gotcha. Now, maybe can you tell me a little bit about the, if there's a you know the upside and the downside in, ter- in terms of a, let's say on a project you're working in a dual capacity, meaning that you're not just the writer, you're not just the actor. Um, is that hard for you to juggle? Well, you know, actually, the first time that happened it was in um, uh, Frankie the Fly, it was, uh, and when I got to be the you know, as the writer, as an actor, and then also on, I, I was hit on the casting of it. So mm-hmm. you really got to see um, that end of it. You know, when an actor comes in, you get to see what what it's like. You know, and mm-hmm. some are extremely nervous, and some are you know wonderful and just nah. And I, I, you know, naturally you get approached by friends when you know you're doing something. So you get you know you got to go through a lot of your friends because you do want to give them an opportunity and, and a chance. Mm-hmm. So. Um, but it's, you know, it's funny because I, you know, you start to believe, you know, uh, I can do anything, you know, it's an actor. I want to do this. I want to do that. I want to do this. And this one guy came in and, and, and he kind of, he was really good, you know, mm-hmm. but it required, it required a physicality that, you know, he was a, he was not a, a big guy and it, it really 
it's one of those roles. I, I mean, I hate to say it, but sometimes you need to be big for you know, or or, or sure. you know, you need to be you're Mexican or or black or you know something. You know what I mean? You need to be. It's just required, you know. I mean, with the role, and he was terrific. And he said, "Well, is, is there anything you know I can do?" And I went. All I could say was, yeah, be six foot four. <laughs> you know? and it's, really, you're perfect, but you're just not six foot four. Sure. You know? So, I mean, when I do things now, I, I, I kind of, you know, I, my agent calls me and says, you want to, you know, read this, you want to, and I'll look at it and I'll read it. And I go, that's not me, you know? Sure. You, you should get somebody else. You say, and I know the guy you should get. So I don't mm-hmm. try to do things that are, you know, not... Really, really, you know, not to say really me, but in my range, you know, you know, uh, okay. you know what I mean. So I, 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 that side of the producing end is is um, was eye opening uh, for me, you know, because I mean you want to give somebody a job, but it's just not right, you know. Oh, of course, I understand definitely. Do you think you'll ever direct? Uh, I think I, I, I don't think so. I think, uh, yeah, I don't think I'm uh, as tolerant as as a lot of people are. Okay. Um, You know, I probably, that's the least of my uh, ambitions. I I think I'd be good, but I think I'd be hard to work with. (laughs) (laughs) I I do. Really? I'm shocked. I I think I'd be. I am. I, uh, I I think I might be a little too direct for some people. I understand. Got it. Okay. You know, I mean, I mean, and maybe if it's just maybe if it's something I wrote, I, I, I'd be worse. Maybe maybe if it was something that I didn't write and I directed, um, okay. I'd be maybe easier. But when I write, I I hear it, I, and I there's no, I know exactly what I'm writing. I know exactly what the voice should sound like, and I know exactly you know. And that's, you know, I'm sure Kurt said the same thing. You know, and he hears mm-hmm. the voices and he hears them, and I hear it. You know, and you know, you, like we're on a series now, so we've been a long time. So I, I naturally, these things will adjust as you know. You're working, so I'm sure he hears. You know, now now they hear me, and you know, the com- it's the combination. They hear, you know, uh, they hear Ron, they hear Katie. You know what I mean? They 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 hear what? the girl. You know, so they'll they'll. They go through the writing a little bit, but I'm not, you know, just, you know. Mm-hmm. I get it. Maybe. Okay. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. No, I know exactly what you're saying. Okay. So no, I'm going to write a screenplay. Go ahead. Yeah. No, no, no. That's all right. Go ahead. Finish. No. Well, I mean, when you write a screenplay, it's, it's you know, it's different than, than working every week on a, on a TV show. It's a different, it's a different type of writing. You know, uh, I think... Um, not, you know, neither here nor there. It's just you write a screenplay from start to finish, and, and you, 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 uh, you know, there's there's, there's 190 pages, so 120 pages, and you, you know the way it's going. With, with a television show, it's it's always little changes here and there. And, you know, uh, I'm not. A, I, don't, I don't think I, I would write the, for TV. And I'm more of I think playwright and and, and a screenwriter. Uh, just because I it's control. <laughs> <laughs> sure. I can see that. I definitely can see that. Okay, now i got to admit something here. Um, it wasn't until recently that the person interviewing you had a chance to finally watch Deadwood for the first time. <laughs> it's embarrassing. Yes, I finally watched uh-huh. it because I wanted to see you as Charlie Utter. Um, uh-huh. I know your stint was for 36 episodes and uh, the nomination, of course, from SAG for Outstanding Performance by an Ensemble in the Drama Series. Uh, first off, can you tell me the main motivating reason in your selection to take this role? I'm sorry, I'm sorry what did you say? The, the what? Oh, that's okay. Can you tell me the main reason for you eventually selecting to be on this show? Why did you take this role? Well, uh, first of all, I'm a, I'm a cowboy at heart. <laughs> you know, really? I was, I was born in cities, but I'm always comfortable. Uh, um, you know that's where my my uh, my head goes a lot of times. It's um, you know I rode my bicycle down the street thinking I was Roy Rogers, you know. 
it's, you know, it's had a little fucking outfit on and all that shit. And, you know, I'm mm-hmm. there I am riding down fucking Newark. You know, imagine I'm in the Wild West. So, you know, I was always uh, fond of that. And, but no one would ever give me a chance. Um, and, of, you know, they, they want to pigeonhole you a lot of times and, and, and cast them in these things. They say, oh, well, this is what he does, this is what he does. And, you know, I always said, uh, all the way, I, I'll do what they say I can do um, to get my foot in the door. But when I get my foot in the door, I'm going to do other things, you know, other characters, you know, that I believe I could play. Mm-hmm. And um, when I, I was friends with David and uh, Milch, and, and um, he, uh, he, um, we were good one, buddy. He would, um, uh, you know, he was had this, you know, but he was looking at my writing, and we were taking me and Madsen, and we were doing stuff, and and Deadwood came about, and and he said, um, "Would you like to do something in Deadwood?" And I said, "I'd, I'd love the opportunity, you know." And um, but what really happened with that was, um, so I was supposed to only be on that show for three episodes, and maybe. Um, Maybe, um, you know, come back once in a while. But um, mm-hmm. they liked what I did, um, I guess, with Chris Albrecht and the big shots. And, and I, you know, Charlie Utter was supposed to have, because he's a real person, he was supposed to have uh, his shop, uh, livery, uh, what do you call it, fucking freight business in Cheyenne. And in real life, he went back and forth to Deadwood. And and when I saw Chris Albert, basically said, why don't you keep his shop in Deadwood? (laughs) You know, this way I could be there and Mm -hmm. wouldn't leave town. Because, you know, I mean, they liked what I was doing. So then it turned into three years. So, you know, that's that's the way that happened. And uh, that's a fun job. It's really a fun job. You know, you're you're really, uh, you just wanted to do good, you know. But, you know, you didn't want to be the... You know, the weak link. So that's the way that came about. Now, did you, if I were to ask you what you personally enjoyed most about your character, what would you say? Oh. Uh, me and Charlie Otter? Mm hmm. Um, you know, just the opportunity to just be that guy. Sure. Every week. Uh, that really, that's, it was, you know, it was always a surprise, like kind of what would, would go on. And, and what, you know, he's a hard guy to work for. David's not, really? it's not easy. It, well, you don't get scripts. You just get pages, you know, and you get pages like, you know, night before, two nights before maybe, you know. And, and it's, you know, that, that particular dialogue was very difficult. Um, and it, it, it was just a hard, hard, it was a hard job. Um, mm-hmm. because, of, because of that, you know, because of the time crunch on everything, you know, and um, yeah, it's, you know, it's, uh, no actor. Every actor likes to have a, have a little more time with the script, you know. Uh, right. But like once in a while, you would get uh, uh, you know three three days, you know, with some a scene, you know, and they, they were you know difficult scenes. But mm-hmm. he never wanted. He never wanted to. Uh, I never, we never, I saw the pilot. That's the only script we ever saw that was complete. Mm-hmm. Um, everything after that was just pages. But he, uh, I'll get trouble saying this probably, but I think it's pretty much known. Uh, he didn't like uh, his notes. So <laughs> he said if he didn't, he had the script in his head, but he just would not put it on the paper. And mm-hmm. um, so he, didn't, he didn't want notes from, from, uh, Executive. <laughs> so, wow. He uh, he didn't turn in the thing, but it just you know became this machine. But everything he was we were turning out was good, so they let it go, you know. But that's why we never got skips, you know. It was a hard way to work, but it certainly kept you on your toes. You, know? you betcha. And you did very well, and you look different because you have facial I hair. Do. I do, <laughs> don't I? <laughs> It's yeah, darling. Don't funny. don't fool yourself. You betcha. Yeah. Okay, I guess we should probably talk about this other guy that you play in case any of you happen to hear about this little tiny show called Sons of Anarchy, of course, in which uh-huh. um, I 
I have to tell you that your portrayal of Wayne Unser is just nothing short of genius, and that's just my opinion. Oh. Well, it's thank true. you. Yeah. Now, I'm not going to, I, I would, well, Kurt, mm-hmm. Kurt gave me an opportunity. That was another one that, uh, you know, was basically there for, for only two episodes, and, and it turned into something, you know, really, really cool, you know, nice and great for me, you know, but um, I, I guess, Kurt, um, I guess you liked what I was doing, and so we, uh, we just we kept writing, and I, I hope he does. Sure. You know, oh, it's, I gotcha. it's, it's, it's a great character. It's, it's I get to walk the line on, on good and bad, and, <laughs> you know, and and I go, oh, yeah, I've said it a million times. Whenever I'm asked, I just I just try. To, you hear those fucking parrots? Did you hear those parrots? Mm-hmm. Did you hear that? Mm-hmm. No, did you hear the parrots that flew over? The par the parrots? You mean parrots? Parrots? Like yeah. Holly wanted crack? Yeah. Yes, probably want to crack them. Yeah, they, parrots. <laughs> yeah, they just all they yeah. fly over here. They fly. They're the noisiest birds in the world. They just talk really? to each other. Oh, they jabber. <laughs> blah, 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 blah. I swear, they never <laughs> shut up. They never shut up. You hear them coming a mile away, and they just just talking to each other. Anyway, oh, where was that? That's right. right. Okay, I, I wanted to mention. Um, obviously, in my perception, Umster's been the loyal backbone to Sam Crow, of course, and sadly, we've seen him kind of, in my interpretation, he's kind of losing his path as an individual, and of course, fighting the daily battle with cancer. Now, I wanted to ask you, first of all, with this particular role, meaning Umster, is that the one you kind of walked in and said to yourself, "That's what I really want," or did you ever think to yourself you might have been preferred to be cast as a different character? <laughs> Yeah, of course. I wanted Charlie's part. No. <laughs> oh my God! Really? <laughs> no, 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 no. I didn't. I didn't. I didn't want Charlie's part at all. Oh, you know, I, I do have. I do have some, a touch of realism. <laughs> um, what about Clay? Yeah, of course. You know. Yeah. I mean, definitely. You know. I mean, I, I, I'd be a liar if I said I didn't. You know, that's the thing that I wanted, but. Um, I guess they went. They had, they, they had an actor for for uh, the original, and they uh, and then they didn't think didn't work out or something, and so they recast it, and then they cast Ron um, mm-hmm. in the pilot. I mean, they reshot most of, a lot of the pilot that this other person was in, and um, and used Ron, so Ron got the role as Clay. I I, uh, I went in when I originally met. Um, uh, Kurt and, and, and for the this role was I'm I'm I read I was um, in there for Darby. Mm-hmm. You know it was I don't even think there was an answer. Uh, really? And I'm, I'm, yeah. I, well, I'm not in the pilot, so I guess there wasn't an answer. Yeah. Um, right. Darby Darby went to somebody else, and and um, I ended up. In the next episode, with uh, you know, has to do uh, Wayne Unser, and uh, I, I thought it was, you know, was, I, I loved the first episode. It was it was fun. It was great. I thought, wow, this is a cool character, you know. And uh, sure. then you know, another, and then we kept writing. I, I just, you know, I owe it all to Kurt, you know. I mean, uh, but uh, you know, and now I just try to, I just try to, you know, like I said before the parrots flew over. I just try to walk that line between, you know, my friends. The club is my friends. I mean, I know Gemma since she was 14, you know, and and, right. and I know them all as they came into the club, and, and everything was cool for a while. And, you know, you always try to keep them on, on their, do their business outside of town and then keep the townspeople happy. So it's, it's, a, it's a great role for an actor to, you know, to, to have to, that that um, obstacle, you know, uh, uh, how, how do I, you know, how do I tell you to wash your hands before you come to dinner without getting killed, you know? Right. So, <laughs> you know, so it, it's, been, uh, it's been quite a challenge, quite, quite fun, quite a good ride. I bet. Now, relative to Kurt, um, what would you say is the most rewarding aspect of working with him, do you think? Well, I, uh, I don't, you know, I, I don't, I don't, uh, 
I don't have a, I don't have any problems with with Kurt. I don't. We hardly talk much. I mean, we did, we're always. I mean, I like him. And, and, and sure. It, like to me, I, I just, we don't have a whole lot to say. But he seems right, right for me. From uh, I that I feel is just. I don't have a problem. So. Okay. You know, he, you know, I mean, there's, there's so many other, so much other shit comes up when you're in his shoes. You know, it's like, uh, you know, I don't need to bother him with shit I can work out in my head. And so I, I don't really, you know, once in a while, I think I had maybe two questions for him uh, over the years on, on, on certain certain things, a certain word, a certain line. Right. That's it. You know, he seems to, we seem to be on the same, you know, path, whatever it is. You know, so, uh, you know, it's, 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 a, it's been a great experience, you know. I mean, now, I'm, I'm, I'm going to presume this because I've heard this from some of your other fellow castmates on the show. I'm gathering that most of you have not only that great on-screen relationship, but just a great off-screen relationship as well relative to each other. Yeah, we uh, we 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 do. We have a pretty good relationship, you know. I mean, it's like any family. You've been together for five years. You're going to have little things that some. But it goes as fucking parents. You have these um, at least these little things you, maybe you have for a moment in a scene or something, you know. But that's that's all active shit. That's well, you know. When we get okay. when no, we we have. See, my house seems to be the place where I, I, that we have barbecues. I don't even know we're having barbecues. I don't even invite anybody. All of a sudden, there's a barbecue in my house. Well, really? Well, who's coming? Oh, I don't know. And then fucking people show up, and you know, and we're having a barbecue. Uh, I have yet to throw one barbecue myself. You know, Theo oh will throw God. one. No, three or Theo will say one. Charlie will say something. This one will say something. And then we come out here. Oh, okay. You know, so sure. you get along pretty well. You know, I got a That's pool. Awesome. I got a pool, and everybody just gets a chance to be nuts. You know? Gotcha. Sure. <laughs> I understand. I got Maybe it. Maybe it's a surprise. These kooks. <laughs> what up? Um. Here's my question as it relates to your character. This is, again, this is a Cindy question in watching the show. Um, do you think, in terms of answer, is there that romantic link that he's thinking between him and Gemma, or is he just more hurt? In this last season, I noticed that. He kind of had that big scene with her and kind of saying, you know, Gemma, take a look around at where your friends are or aren't. Um, is it just in a really strong friendship, or do you think he has a romantic interest? No. I, in my head, this is the way, I, the way I've always played it, it's always been um, – Platonic, and I okay. just really, really loved the kid since she was growing up. You know, I mean, I, I, then, but no, that doesn't mean he's not capable of having stupid moments. Like I believe he had a stupid moment last year. You know, in his in his moment of everything else is fucked up and going fucked up. You know, you, you, all of a sudden you uh, and this is, you look at your cousin and you say, "Oh, you're really cute." You know, and all of a sudden you go, oh, my God, did I just say my fucking cousin's cute? You know, <laughs> you know what I mean? Like when you're trying to respect and go, oh my God, I just looked at my cousin's tits. You know? <laughs> you, 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 know you know, so I think it's, it, he's capable because he's a man of having those slips. But it's, to me, it's, for the first bunch of years, it's been always, you know, a little sister thing or, or whatever, uh, you, you know. It's been a platonic thing. And then a couple of times, like, you know, she put a move on me that fucked me up a little bit. You know, I mean, I'm sure. You know what I'm saying? Oh, yeah. Uh, yeah, I know that. Up, in, up in, in, in the shed there, the cabin, you know. Right. Um, right. And, and then someone, you know, then all of a sudden you leave it up to interpretation. Like someone can, uh, uh, you know, someone can put their hand, uh, you know, you could be out with a friend or, or a girl, and, you know, and she puts her hand on your knee and, uh, you know, uh, how do I read that? You know what I mean? You can it can be just be a, a, a friendly thing, a gesture, or you can say, "Oh my God, she put her hand on my knee. That must mean something." You know what I mean? In life, I mean, the way you, you, you know, I the mind can do tricks. So, um, sure. and I think that that's what happens to me, uh, you know, with her uh, in okay. the show. So, gotcha. Did that answer? Um, 
It answered it perfectly, actually. Now, I hate to ask this dreaded question, and, and this is just a Dayton Cali question, your interpretation. Um, any thoughts on if you think Umster's going to meet his maker this season, the upcoming one? I'm not even going to touch that. Okay. That's all right. I thought I'd throw it out there. I'm like, let's ask Dayton. Yeah, well, I know you can, can't say. You can throw it out there. You can throw it over the fence. You can throw it anywhere you want. <laughs> I have no idea what Kurt wants. I have no idea. You know, okay. I, hope, I hope I don't. That's for sure. But I have okay. no idea what what Kurt's going to do. I, you know, that's it's a show, man. But, no, uh, I understand. Yeah. Sure. Uh, you know, I got it. That's I hope I always kid him. I, I always we all I've been kidding Kurt since you know day one. And, you know, um, uh, my father had died of cancer, right? But they right. gave him six months, and he lasted seven years. And that's the guy's wow. on his truth. Yeah, he just. He kept fighting off, he kept going to remission, kept coming back, and this and that. It was seven years, and you know, um, and you know, of course, I'm going to look at this. Not more people survive cancer than die from cancer, but you know, <laughs> that's, that's my fucking actor head. <laughs> you know, but whatever Kurt's going to do, he's going to do. I, I understand. Okay, I have one more SLA question, and we'll move on to the next thing. Um, if I were to ask you, in all of your time there so far, do you have one? This one moment out of all of them, either on screen or off screen, has been your favorite so far. Uh, I have to go back, and this is going to seem funny. To, to I think it was, God, I get so confused with the seasons. But one of the best nights I had was when we did the scene where Jean, Je- Gemma got raped. Oh my and, God! But yeah, I, it's, I think it sounds funny, but. Right. But Katie and I, after, you know, not the inside stuff, that was difficult. But we did the outside. We did something where we drive away uh, after I saved her. And, mm-hmm. uh, well, I don't save her. I find her. Um, right. But we, we, we I, I don't know, one, we just started looking at each other. We're in the, we're in the car. But shit happened. It got funny. We fucked up. We couldn't stop laughing. Ah, it, it ah. seems not even in it seems not even a show. It must be on an outtake somewhere. But we laughed for fifteen fucking minutes. Every time we say, cut, cut, okay, okay, let's do this again. And we do and we start and we look at each other and we just we got it was I swear to God, it went on for fifteen minutes and, and you know, I'm sure the the, the uh UPM was flipping out because we were taking too much time. <laughs> you know, sure. it, was, it was late at night. It was twelve thirty at night. We were just silly. It was just, and one of us would start. We'd look at each other, and, and we'd—it's like you know when the teacher's going to yell at you if you laugh, or your yep. parent, and you you <laughs> just can't help it. You know, you're yep. going to get a beating. You're going to get a beating because you can't. It's just <laughs> too funny, you know. And that's right. I, that that scene in will stick in my mind forever. It was the most. Hysterical, funny thing I've ever had. Cool. We just couldn't stop making each other laugh, and that, I swear it went on for fifteen minutes at least. You know. Look at that. Anyway. Yeah. Good story. <laughs> okay. Now to highlight each and every one of your roles that you portray would probably take us I don't even know all day. So um, I wanted to bring to light maybe some of your more recognizable roles, and this is television wise because I know you've been to name a few: CSI, The Closer, The Practice, Law and Order. Judging Amy, NYPD Blue. Um, was it always your intention to perform in the more the dramatic based genre? I'm a I I was I was my first job was in it was in Kate and Alley and it was a was a sitcom. Mm-hmm. I I I was a, I always thought I'd be doing sitcoms, you know. I mean um drama they just, you know, when you're starting out, you, you, go, you go anywhere. You know, you just you just take a job and hopefully you do it good and people want you back. But right. uh, I just got into that, and, and that goes back to what I was saying. People kind of pigeonhole you uh, in this business, and until you prove them different, and you really got to prove them different twice, mm-hmm. they'll want to stick you, you know, in certain things. You know, like I said, nobody's going to give me a, a Western. Yeah, you know, they're looking. You know, they meet me and say, "Well, you guys fucking Western." Yeah, got it. Because so. I would have gathered 
I, me personally, I would have gathered your heart would have been more towards the comedic roles. And I wondered if you ever debated that possibility of just maybe saying, I'm going to veer strictly in the direction of something like that now. You know, now that you are more well, selective, I'm guessing you can be selective. I think I'm, no, but I, I mean, I think I'm a funny guy, but people, you know, I think I could, I think I can do, I mean, if you look, I got some comedy reels that are, you know, funny. It's, it's I don't do Steve Martin type of, you know, that kind of comedy, you, you know. I, I, I I, I mean, I based my comedy in, in, in just a different center. Um, yeah, I, I find the, the way I write is, is comedy comes out of the drama, you know. Okay. Yeah, I had, in my life, I had to look at it that way. You know, this is, this is fucking funny. You know, when I'm, you know, watching these people get shot at, and, you know, in front of me and playing as a musician, that shit's funny. I mean, it's dangerous and it's daily, but, all, but I mean, you got to look at it like, oh, my God, play the fucking song again, you know. Yeah, right. close to death. Yeah, it's funny. You know, it's funny as soon as you get out of it. <laughs> you know, you know. So right. I, I kind of like the comedy that comes out of drama. Well, yeah. what? I was going to say I describe your wit as being it's best described. Pardon the pun, because I know everybody's going to go, "Ha ha!" You have a wit about you which I just think is charming. It makes you just more charming. <laughs> my, it's just my opinion. I know, pardon the pun, no. charming, charming, ha ha, SOA. I guess. Thank you. Thank <laughs> no, no. I guess quite you. welcome. I thought um, it was, that's, and it's great. Okay. I like let's talk about oh, Good. I like <laughs> film, so let's talk about film. Um, just to highlight some of your credits, I know that you've done um, Derailed, obviously, Tu Wong Fu, Halloween 2. Um, Halloween 2 scares the hell out of me, so I'll never watch you in it. Um, I can't either. Me too. I don't I can't watch it. Uh, Thank you very much. Now, I know um, I've looked at your IDB, of course, and I know there's roughly about 30 films you've done, and I'm gathering many more will come in the future. Can you highlight to us your personal take on this one? What do you find more arduous, filming on a television series or on a major film, and why? Well, what's the word? Arduous, meaning, you know, is it more complex and more difficult in terms of filming a TV series or filming a film? Or yeah, filming a film, for lack of a better term. Um, I think it's. I guess I'd have to say it's harder on a TV series. The, the grind is, is uh, you know, I mean, it goes from episode to episode. But it's just some episodes, can you, you know, you can be light in, and it's it's fairly easy. And certain episodes, you're, you know, you're written heavy, and and it's more difficult. It, it depends on the on the thing. But is that there's that constant grind of having to stay in character and having to stay, you know, um, for a long, long period of time on a TV show. Um, the, the film stuff is, you know, they, 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 they film it slower. You get more opportunity uh, to talk about something if you want to or work something out a little different if you want to maybe, you know. Film I and mean, TV, you got to go. You know, we don't have time for this shit. You know, we, we're shooting in seven days. You know, come in fucking prepared, and let's let's do this. You know, and sure. it's different. It's a different kind of professionalism, I believe. It's a uh, you know, you know, do your homework. And, I mean, the film is supposed to do your homework at home too. You know, you don't you don't want to waste time. But right. you, you, you know, film you got the script much longer. You have it. You know, you can you can look at the stuff and. Uh, you know, maybe you get a film months before, you know, a month or so beforehand, or you know, a couple of weeks beforehand. You know, every week a new script comes out. And, you know, you're working on the last one, and you, you got to learn the next one. You know, so it, it's a uh, that's a different grind. You know? Gotcha. I got it. This I find an intriguing question. How, in your opinion, how have you changed or evolved as an actor over the span of all this time? Um. I know, uh, I guess, I'm a little more confident in um, just how the, just how the game works, how to, how, to, how the, uh, you know, I mean, by, by game, I mean, uh, when can you really ask questions, when can you, you know, when is it not time, um, when, you know, I, I think I, I, I'm, I've, I've grown to know, Myself, what I can do and what I can't do, and and like I way back to the beginning, you know, I, I can't be six five, you know, so you know, don't try, 
Uh, yeah, uh, I, I just learned how to, uh, I, I think I've grown to be a much more professional, you know. I try not to mm-hmm. take things that aren't personal, personal you know. Um, and, 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 you know, reading, working with people is easier. Yeah, I've grown that way. It's, uh, I mean, I still can get, I guess, uppity or tough for certain, you know, things. Mm-hmm. You know, if I believe something in my heart that should be done this way, I, I'm not doing this because, oh, I want to do it this way. I'm doing it because I, I, this is the way I think the character would do it. You know, I mean, and please, you know, prove me wrong because this is the only way I see it. Mm-hmm. You know, I mean, that's why I, I try to commit to a character that way. Uh, and it's like I said, change my mind. But, you know, this shit you're giving me right now, I mean, one of the funniest things I've ever heard is, is from Bill Sanderson. We were doing Deadwood, and, and I was standing was that there was um, um, me and Bill Hickok coming in to the... To the to the, uh, to the what the fuck the hotel lobby to check in and, and Billy Billy the Sanderson is, is EB Forum he played behind the counter you know the hotel clerk right. and the director was directing the scene the director tells Billy he says well you know and this, it was something for camera and, 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 and so he wanted to force Billy to do this move over here from there to there you know and and the director said could you what do this and can, can you put that over there and go over there and and, and Billy looked at him and he goes, well I, I, I guess if I was a bad actor I could do it that way. Mm-hmm. <laughs> this was the funniest thing I ever heard. <laughs> we cracked up, you know. And he goes, what? And he goes, well I guess if I was a bad actor I'd move over there, but I don't see why I would go over there. So you know, there's 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 you got to stand up for yourself sometimes in, in the most ridiculous kind of ways. But, oh, you know, he, was, he was right. He shouldn't have. You know, it was, it was a it was a fake move. You know, sure. and uh, a false move. You know, you know. Anyway. Okay, I I got two more questions for you, and then I'll let you go. The first of which, um, have you ever looked back on your entire career and thought to yourself, hmm, maybe I should have been a musician solely instead of an actor? Or do you think you made the right call? I. I definitely right, made the right call. I just wish I would have played along the way. Okay. Um, <laughs> you know, I mean, uh, I, 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 I think I was pretty good as a musician, but, I, I mean, I don't know. I, I doubt I would ever be a cold trainer of Sonny Rollins, but, you know, and I, I reside to that fact that I would, you know, I would, but I now I want to play just to play and play for myself and play for friends and, you know, the enjoyment of them. There's a, there's a camaraderie when you're a musician and you're in a group. There's a there's, a, there's nothing like it. That, that's the only difference between acting and and um, um, being a musician. When you're on stage and you're playing, it's like fucking happening, man. And it's not happening for like 30 seconds or a minute. It's happening for, you know, we, could, so we used to play these some jazz songs. We play a half hour, and you're just wow. mixing back forth and just going, you know, you're just playing off each other, and it's, and it's nothing like that feeling, you know, mm-hmm. and acting, you don't get that opportunity, you do in a play a little bit, you get to, you know, be uh, continuous, you know, but in, in film and TV, you know, you got a three minute, four minute scene, and it's over, so you never get that same kind of high you do as a, music, a musician, I mean, you get to enjoy it later as an actor, but uh, then, and, you know. Gotcha. So okay. I would have never been cold trained. I understand, but, I but you know. I'll, 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 I'll make myself a little happy. <laughs> you know. And by the way, the, the answer to the question I just gave you was, hell yes, you've done amazingly well as an actor, and hell yes, you made the right choice. Just going to throw that out uh, there for my little piece. Thank you. All right. Our last question revolves all around Deaton Kelly, not the actor, not the writer, not that, just you, the man. I uh, wanted to ask three questions. Um, do you do anything normal? <laughs> now, let's see how he wants to answer this. Meaning, drive your own car, that kind of jazz and stuff. I mean, when we see Dayton Kelly out at the supermarket, is he just a regular guy? Oh, you bet. You bet. Really? Yep. Mm-hmm. Okay. I, and, okay. You know, and I I usually, you know, what goes along with the territory is just say hello to a lot of people. And sure. some of them are shocked. You used to be more shocked. When Deadwood was out, because they 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 would look at me and they would see me. And I'd have my beard and all that shit, and they'd look at me in the supermarket and they'd go, 
and they would be stunned, like, what the fuck is Charlie Utter doing in, in <laughs> Rouse? You know? And, <laughs> so it took him, because, wow, he's 107 years old. He should be dead. But, you know, sure. it, I was out of context, and it would really freak them out. So that was, it was kind of funny, you know. That's and, all. I and, you know, they, they, they'd follow you around and go, are you, you, are you really, you, is that you? And, and you go, yeah, it's, it's me. I'm still alive. <laughs> You know? <laughs> I'm yeah. not in debt anymore. Ever, I was going to say, do you ever get overwhelmed maybe by just the amount of popularity that you sustain all the time? Yes. Yeah, it's still hard to believe. I, I'm always shocked when people, I'm still shocked when people um, know me. You know? Really? Um, I, I, yeah. Um, I, I, I'm, 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 yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm shocked. And I'm shocked when, um, I just heard, I don't want to mention any names, but, um, I just two famous, uh, people. One's a musician and one's an actor. Um, mm -hmm. and this person mentioned my name to them and they go, oh, they're huge fans of yours. And it made me think like, wow, I don't even think this fucking guy knows me, you know, but they're huge fans, you know. So that's always a little shocking, you know. Because, uh, you know, I mean, I still think of myself as just me. Sure. You know? But, so I guess it would shock you to know that there is about, I don't know, a million people I could think of that truly adore you. And when I say adore, uh, I mean adoration. No, that's very really nice. Thank you very much. Well, you're yeah. very welcome. I, so how do we do here? Job. What do you think? Did we do oh, a good job okay. here? Uh, you were wonderful. I don't know how I was. Oh, <laughs> I have to tell you. Did you that? Oh, I have to say, now if I can just have you just listen for 30 seconds or something I want to say, because I always end my interviews doing this, because I've had 60 minutes to listen to my assessment of you, so I'm going to tell Dayton Callie what I think of him, because it'll probably be the only time I'll ever get to do it, <laughs> unless I do meet you. Um, I have to say that I have, it's been a very long time for me that I've done an interview that's not only captivated my interest so much, and I've been so overwhelmed by their talent but their kindness, their generosity and giving of themselves. You are amazing. What you do, what you present on screen, who you are as a person, the little that I know of you, your wit, your character, your charm, your essence. It's just a joy to talk to you. It's a joy to know you. Um, I could never say anything bad about you. I, I'm overwhelmingly impressed. And if you'd let me, I would drag my ass out to California sometime and I'll buy you lunch. How's uh, that? That's a deal. That's a deal. That and, sounds uh, wonderful. And thank you very much. Uh, I I'm, 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 uh, don't know what to say, but um, thank yeah. you. Yes, thank you. Very, very very nice. yes. yes, and I, I thank you so much. Thank you for taking the hey. time to, to come on our show. We'll do this again sometime. I would appreciate that so much. I'll be in contact with okay. you. You know that. Just hook me up All on right. Facebook there. We'll find each other. All right, Dal, take right. care. We'll, we'll do it again. Thank you very much. It was wonderful. All right, dude. Have a good day. Bye-bye. Okay, folks. Can you believe it? That was Dayton Kelly. Was that just not the most amazing interview I've had? Wow. I can say that I actually am just kind of tingly here. Um, it doesn't happen here on the show. As I am, obviously, just as excited with Aldo and with everyone else that's come on the show. Um, obviously, anybody to you who's new to listening and not as familiar with Sons of Anarchy or Sam Crow Radio, we appreciate all of your support, all of the time, all of the effort that you put into getting the word out and, of course, participating and listening into the show. Always, always, always saying thank you so much to my fellow partner in crime, Sam Crow, obviously to the Sam Crow um, Eaters Club, all of you who participate, listen, support. It is undoubtedly, hands down, a privilege and a pleasure for me to know each and every one of you and to keep providing you with these shows. Um, I wish I could tell you what we had on deck for next week yet. Um, we're working on one of two different individuals. So it's looking like we'll either be on air either the 15th or 16th. And, again, for those of you who don't know, we have a uh, radio page on Facebook entitled Sam Crow Radio and, obviously, uh, on Twitter as well, at Sam Crow Radio. So please feel free to check us out. You all have yourself a wonderful day. I'm going to be out and about. Um, enjoy your day. I'm going out in the snow. We'll talk to you soon. Thanks. What's you doing? I'm running out of space on my phone, so I'm deleting some stuff. Bye, singing dog. Bye, goal. I pronounce you. Bye, wedding ceremony.
Stop. At Metro PCS, you get two free phones with twice as much memory. Really? Don't say bye to your memories. Switch to Metro PCS and get two free LG K20 Plus phones with 32 gigs when you switch two lines. Metro PCS. Wireless. Figure it out. Coverage not available in some areas. Sales tax not included in phone price. Excludes numbers on the T-Mobile network. See store for details and terms and conditions.